let me tell you, if there's one thing that can strike terror into my heart, it's an invitation to contribute something to our little festival. Thanks, Kirk. I've written a story and I'd like to share it with you. All my childhood bumps, teenage angst and education preparation had not prepared me for this. I was an innocent. Then I met Marilyn. Oh, it was great at first. Meeting her was wonderful. Meeting her family was great. And I discovered in the course of that meeting that her dad was an amazing man. You name it, he could build it for you. Wood, metal, plastic, it didn't matter. And he certainly didn't need a map to do it with. Marriage, however, would reveal me something new I had never imagined with Marilyn. She thought all men came with the same skills as her dad. When our new apartment needed additional furniture, she asked me to make it. Who was I to tell her I couldn't? So away we went. Friends let me use their power tools. We had a lot of adventurous stories, like the response of my friends and neighbors when they saw smoke streaming from their basement floor one Monday morning and a strange man had just come up in his car. However, the table got completed. It served the purpose we had in mind. In fact, we were quite pleased with it. It also served as a climbing place for our children and after 20 years of service was repurposed in a number of different ways. So began my new hobby, woodworking. Shortly after completion of the table, we moved to the Ottawa Valley, part of auction country, wonderful. We would get our furniture by purchasing it at auction and I myself would refinish it. Uh, the start came as a bit of a shock. I thought a grain in a piece of furniture meant there was grain in the wood. Whoops! How was I to know some of this grain was applied? And if you used paint remover on that grain, you ended up with a puddle below the dresser drawer. It's the only applied grain I ever bought. However, our home now is full of refinished furniture, which we have enjoyed over the years. Why, I was even able to create a few original wood pieces, including a table made from a 16 foot organ pipe made of pine. The little music stand in the choir stalls, which Kirk uses from time to time, was made from scrap wood from one of St. Matthew's long discarded pews. When the need for furniture dried up, I turned to what? Others. What fun. From my first grasshopper toy, through a monster truck, a tow truck, rocking horses, motorcycle, a pedal car, a Ferris wheel, all of these I could create and enjoy even more as children played with it. And of course, toys designed by our grand grandchildren, which we built and decorated together. When the need for toys slowed down, pen making, I love pens, always have too many around me. But now I could turn them for myself. I could turn them for family. I could turn them for friends. I could sell them. Fountain pens, ballpoint pens, mechanical pencils, you name them. Made from common and exotic, and exotic woods, from acrylic, from burls, even from a bowling ball. And for my caffeine-addicted friends, acrylic 
impregnated with coffee beans, which released their flavor for years each time they would be used. I have two photos with which I would like to end my little story. This hammer shows the marks of 50 years of service. It works as well as the day I got it. It is the cherished gift of my father-in-law, which he gave to me as part of a pack of essential tools. The occasion, my ordination as a priest. He got things straight on that one. The ferry boat is my major unfinished business right now. It has been unfinished for years. The child to whom I thought I might give it is now far too old, but soon it will be finished to find a new right home. The hammer is to me a constant reminder of the power of caring friends, quality equipment, and the joy of receiving gifts. The ferry boat affirms again the opportunities to complete the vision as we move on the road ahead. What lies there, we know not, but we will be ready, hammer in hand. The poem I'm going to share with you today is titled God's Grandeur by the English poet and Roman Catholic priest, Gerard Manley Hopkins. I'm going to begin by reading the poem straight through without interruption. It's a sonnet, so it's very brief, only 14 lines long. After that, I'll provide a brief reflection on the poem and then conclude by presenting it a second time. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and bears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. And though the last light off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with, ah, bright wings. The poem begins with an enthusiastic celebration of God's world. It then descends quickly into an angry lament over the ways in which humanity has damaged the environment. And then the poem ends up with words of hope and comfort. It's very concentrated, as sonnets often are. Everything is done in a very focused and uh, disciplined style. But let's just take a look at it and see how these divisions work. First, the celebration. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It's like electric. You can feel it buzzing, humming with God's grandeur. And then Hopkins uses two very brief and very vivid images. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. We think of aluminum foil. If you scrunched it up and waved it in the sunlight, you'd see a thousand different things flashing. Hopkins actually had gold foil. He was a little better. He had gold foil in mind when he did it and the flashing would be even more brilliant. That's one kind of grandeur. And then he says, God gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. That's an image from the olive presses where the olives would be put in and the great drops of olive oil would gather at the bottom until they were just trembling in vitality and then they would go down. That's God's grandeur. And he's very excited about that. That's the first portion of the poem. Then comes the angry lament. We tend to think, I think, in our culture of the problems regarding climate change and uh, environmental pollution and so on as being contemporary problems of the late 20th and 21st century. And of course they are. But in fact, the issue of damage to God's earth goes back a great deal further than that. Many people would date it from the 
beginnings of the Industrial Revolution uh, in the early 18th century, in other words, almost 300 years ago, with the building of the huge factories and the filthy mines and the satanic mills and the horrendous conditions under which the men and women had to work who were driven to those places for their livelihood. Hopkins was writing about 150 years later, and by that time the pollution had invaded the large metropolitan cities, and the air that they breathed was literally toxic. It was killing people to live in those cities. And it's that kind of pollution which is the source of Hopkins' disgust, and he uses words like seared and bleared and smeared and smudged and smell to show how humanity has contaminated the gifts that God has given us. And he ends this section with a, an image about a foot. He says, we've lost touch, literally, with nature because we put hobnail boots on and our feet no longer feel in touch with God and with nature. Feet cannot feel when they're shod with the boots of industrialization. That's the second part of the poem. But the third section rescues us from that a mood of despair and unhappiness and provides comfort and hope. Because, Hopkins tells us, the life-giving, creative spirit of God triumphs over the destructive forces of humanity. And uh, again, he uses a series of images. He says, there lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. If you can look closely enough and clearly enough, you can still see the life force of nature brimming from within everything we've tried to do to it. And as he began with two images of God's grandeur, so he concludes with two images of hope and comfort. The first is almost universal in our experience. It would require someone looking to the west at sunset and the darkness begins to come and envelop us and, and uh, smother us in, in, in hopelessness. But a little bit later, the next morning, the new dawn springs and comes up and fills us with life and hope. Hopkins, of course, is a, is a Christian and uh, is very aware of that symbol in the resurrection of our Lord on Easter Sunday morning. And so we think of that when we hear morning at the brown brick eastward springs. The final image is a very, it's almost a domestic image. It's very concrete and simple and touching, I think, in its simplicity. And that's to describe the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, um, as, as a mother hen, giving protection and comfort to her chicks. And so as she does that for her chicks, so God's Holy Spirit provides protection and life and care and love for we, for us, God's children. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod, and all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil, and bears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, Nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness, deep down things. And though the last light off the black west went, O oh morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah bright wings.